This is Jim Pruitt, and you listen to another episode of the Farm So Hard podcast. So I farm so hard, the employees want to find me, and then want to hire me. What's 100K to a guy like me? Could you please remind me? Farm so hard, this ain't easy. Working late nights, you best believe me. My grades can only go ace. Never want to see another B unless I'm Jay-Z. Farm so hard, let's get paid. Let's get paid. What's good, fam? It's your host, Jim Pruitt, a.k.a. Farm D in the ED. Today, we have a special episode in which you're not going to hear me run my big mouth. I'm going to let my buddy Stan and RJ talk about something that's highly prevalent within America and something that you guys are probably treating in your ER. I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to those guys. Hey, this is Dan McCollum for EM Basic and Farm So Hard podcast. Here to talk about the use of medications to treat opiate use disorder. Joining in, my name is RJ LaCourcier. I'm one of the emergency medicine pharmacists at Augusta University Medical Center. So RJ, let's open up with a case. Uh, Really common presentation. You've got a gentleman, 33 years old. He comes in the emergency department. He's been using heroin for several years now. He started off on prescription pills, had a problem, eventually graduated to IV drug use. He hasn't used any opiates in the last 16 hours, and he feels like he's withdrawing pretty hard right now. Normally, he spends about $75 a day on heroin, and he's here for help. Several years ago, if you asked me how to take care of this guy, I would say, hey, he's not having an emergency right this second. I'm just going to give him some clonidine, maybe some Zofran, and say, best of luck, buddy. Try to figure it out on your own. But it seems like that's kind of passe now. Right, Dan. That has been uh, a method of treatment in the past to just address symptoms as they come up, because we know that unlike alcohol withdrawal, opioid withdrawal is not fatal, um, even in severe cases. So we typically don't treat this as a severe acute distress situation, especially when you consider the stigma associated with this disease state and physicians being trained in the past that these were not actually patients, but they were simply there to clog up the ED. So what we can do is treat the opioid withdrawal and get them set up for success and and potentially enrolled in a long-term abstinence program or a medication-assisted treatment program. Awesome. So we're going to be talking about medication-assisted treatment today, or MAT, And first off, let's set the background. Why does this matter? Why is it such a big deal that we up our game when we're treating opioid use disorder? So the numbers from a couple of years ago showed that over 130 people die every day in this country from opioid-related drug overdoses. And these are not just people shooting heroin. These are uh, oftentimes people abusing or misusing prescription drugs, either prescribed to them following an accident or a surgery or uh, medications they find in loved ones' medicine cabinets. In addition to opioid overdoses and related situations, we also are seeing uh, an almost fourfold increase between 2004 and 2013. So these are old numbers, and and I expect the the new data is is even worse. But there's almost a fourfold increase in neonatal abstinence syndrome, babies being born into the NICU in opioid withdrawal. We're also seeing increases in the spread of hep C and HIV, which is often traced to illicit drug use. So we need to focus on these patients a lot more than we did. You've probably had a lot more discussions about the proper care of the blunt trauma patient than you have on opioid use disorder, even though more people are dying every year from overdoses than due to car crashes. So RJ, let's go back to that clinical scenario. You've got a gentleman, he presented for help. Why is it that he needs more than just Zofran and a handshake? So while the Zofran will treat the the nausea associated with the opioid withdrawal, it won't address the root problem at the mu opioid receptor. These are empty receptors that are screaming for someone to hold their hand. And we can substitute heroin or Percocet with buprenorphine and satisfy that, that withdrawal craving with a drug that has a low euphoric effect, um, but offers some comfort. So what you're saying is, in the same way that I shouldn't go around yelling at my type 1 diabetics about how their, their insulin receptors just aren't being tickled the right way, instead of increasing the stigma of these patients that need to have that mu opioid receptor tickled with something, we should instead look at what is the safest drug that we can use that both gets them back to function without necessarily generating that further addiction with euphoria. Is that right? Yes, that's right, Dan. And it's actually a very, very safe drug. 
if you give someone buprenorphine, the largest concern that we have as clinicians is putting them into acute withdrawal. But if they're already in acute withdrawal from opioids, giving them buprenorphine is very safe um, and can actually protect them if they go out into the community right after getting buprenorphine. It will potentially protect them from overdosing. It will make it very hard for them to overdose with that buprenorphine in their system. This is because buprenorphine has a much higher affinity for these mu opioid receptors than any of the opioids they might be abusing. So it will not only kick these illicit drugs off of the receptor, but it will block additional administration of these illicit drugs from binding to the receptor. So you can abuse drugs, you just won't get the euphoric effect from them or the respiratory depression and overdose symptoms. So an old attending of mine used to speak out heavily against methadone, saying, hey, if you give a patient methadone and they go out later tonight and shoot up heroin, they could be at risk for an overdose. Are you saying that this drug is actually a lot safer? Because even if I give this buprenorphine in the emergency department, if they continue to use opioids outside of the clinical setting, that they actually won't be as likely to have an overdose? That's correct. And that's in large part due to the partial opioid agonist effect of buprenorphine versus the full opioid agonist effect of methadone. If you give a patient methadone, you are basically giving them a basal rate of opioid, like a long-acting insulin, which, as we all know, will lower your blood sugar. If you add short-acting insulin on top of that, you can easily plummet. If you think of methadone as your basal opioid, adding heroin, adding Percocet, adding some, some type of fentanyl product that's out there, you're basically giving these patients a head start on overdosing if they have methadone in their system. That's not to say that methadone is not a great drug for a lot of people. It's just something that you need to consider in the emergency department setting. All right. So to recap some of this pharmacology, it sounds like buprenorphine is going to have a higher affinity for those receptors than most any other opioid that we see, including heroin, oxycodone, et cetera. Yet it's only a partial agonist. So it can actually trigger withdrawal if given to someone that's acutely intoxicated with opioids, but on its own is actually very, very safe because it doesn't hit the receptor quite as hard as those others. Is that right? That's right, Dan. There is a ceiling effect associated with buprenorphine in that you can give doses and not experience a, a, a euphoric effect. However, you can completely cease any withdrawal symptoms by dosing it appropriately and block potential uh, overdose situations. All right, RJ. So let's zoom back in on our patient. He comes in, he wants some help. He's tired of using heroin and you're considering the use of buprenorphine. Before I just run in there and administer buprenorphine, what are some things I need to consider before administering this drug? So the main thing you want to make sure before you give buprenorphine is, is this patient in acute opioid withdrawal? As I mentioned earlier, this is one of the very few safety aspects associated with buprenorphine is that it can precipitate acute withdrawal. So if your patient isn't in withdrawal, giving this drug can put them there. Not only will this be extremely uncomfortable for the patient, it will basically turn them against future attempts at using Suboxone because of the way it makes them feel. So we want to make sure they're already pretty uncomfortable before we give them buprenorphine. And we do this by assessing the clinical opiate withdrawal scale, or the COWS. The COWS is broken down into mild, moderate, moderate, severe, and severe withdrawal. So based on the level of withdrawal that your patient is experiencing at the time of the assessment, that will determine your initial or subsequent buprenorphine doses. So if I have a patient that's not really withdrawing very hard yet, they have minimal symptoms, I might want to have a conversation with them about future use of buprenorphine to connect them to treatment. But if I give it to them right now, I'll induce withdrawal. If they're having moderately bad symptoms of withdrawal, it'd be very appropriate to go ahead and start the buprenorphine. And if they're having really severe symptoms, I might increase my dose a bit, going from a standard four milligrams considering eight milligrams if they're in severe withdrawal. Is that about right? Yes, that's right. Certain areas in the country may need to give higher doses based on the potency of the opioids in their region. However, uh, using, using a, a lower dose like two or four milligrams for mild or moderate withdrawal and then for severe withdrawal, starting with an eight milligram dose is, is relatively standard. Now, RJ, I heard something about having to have an X waiver. And if I don't have an X waiver yet, am I allowed to give this medicine in the emergency department? 
Yes. So you're referring to the DEA X waiver that's required for providers to write prescriptions for buprenorphine in the outpatient setting. However, in the emergency department or in inpatient settings, any provider can write orders for buprenorphine. You just can't send them out with a script to fill somewhere else. This DEA X waiver is currently being offered for free at a website that we will post in the show notes. But for administration in the ED, we can give a dose on their initial visit and redose patients for a maximum of up to 72 hours. So patients can be treated, leave the ED um, when they start experiencing withdrawal again in several hours or uh, the next day, they can come back for up to three days. This is basically to allow for patients who can't be seen in a clinic right away in the outpatient setting to come back and continue to be dosed so they don't feel that they have to return to their old habits. All right. So it sounds like there's no reason not to go ahead and get X waivered. You should do the free training and get it. But in the meantime, it's totally acceptable for us to administer doses in the emergency department, try to get them referred to an outpatient clinic that could consider continuing the buprenorphine treatment. And they have up to 72 hours where they can keep coming back into the emergency department for continued doses if that's required as you try to get that outpatient set up. Is that about right? That's right. You, you just need to get them tied into an outpatient clinic as quickly as possible. You, we want this transition to be as smooth as possible. And this is honestly usually the most difficult part of treating this disease is the what's called the warm handoff from uh, hospital or inpatient or emergency medicine care to the outpatient setting. This is where we lose a, a majority of these patients um, to follow up. So easing this transition in any way we can is going to help the patient immensely. Uh, we can involve social work. We can involve case managers, um, any, any resource your hospital has, I would recommend using. And as far as getting X waivered, while it's not required in most programs, um, any emergency medicine resident or attending physician will see these patients in any emergency department in our country. This, this is not a local problem. This is affecting everyone everywhere. So if you think you're not going to see people in opioid withdrawal, you're just mistaken. I'm sorry, but that's the reality of, of the situation we have right now. So RJ, a lot of these outpatient clinics are using something called Suboxone. It seems like it's buprenorphine combined with naloxone. What, what's that about? So basically, the active ingredient that we're using to treat the opioid withdrawal is buprenorphine. Suboxone is a combo product that pairs this buprenorphine with naloxone. This is only formatted in this way to deter the potential for abuse. So if you were to melt down a suboxone strip, you could inject it and potentially get a very minimal euphoric effect, but stave off some withdrawal symptoms uh, in an unsupervised, unlicensed <laughs> capacity uh, out on the, on the street. However, if you do that with Suboxone, with that naloxone component added on, you will immediately uh, Narcan yourself because that's what naloxone is. You will be treating opioid overdose um, and throwing yourself into acute withdrawal and having a bad day. If you use Suboxone the way it's intended, which is uh, either dissolving under the tongue or taking a tablet, the naloxone passes straight through your GI tract and is not absorbed systemically. So we don't consider the, the naloxone portion as, as a drug that we're giving our patients when suboxone is used appropriately. It's primarily as an abuse deterrent in the outpatient setting. Another thing to consider for these patients is additionally prescribing or dispensing naloxone. These are patients that are at high risk in this transition period. While we ideally want them to get tied into a clinic and enrolled in getting buprenorphine daily and controlling their withdrawal that way, we can't ignore the, the likelihood that they might turn back to their old habits. They might have gone several days without using opioids. They might know that they need more opioids to overcome the buprenorphine effects. So uh, they're at increased risk of overdose. So we should be at least considering who may benefit from getting naloxone. If nothing else, these patients probably know and hang out with people that use drugs too, and they might be the one to save someone else's life. For the last part of our conversation, I want to talk about why this is so important. RJ, is there any data about why the use of buprenorphine actually leads to better patient outcomes? I hear all this talk about this drug I've never used before. Sounds a little scary. I've never done it before. 
why should I change my practice? So as we've discussed, uh, this is a historically underserved patient population that we're definitely seeing much more often in, in all areas of this country. So it is something we need to learn how to treat and treat better. As far as hard data, there have been some RCTs or randomized clinical trials. So 78% of patients treated with buprenorphine were maintained in some form of addiction treatment 30 days after randomization. So we, we do have data to support the use. We do have more literature coming out about induction programs in the ED and then transferring patients to outpatient settings with largely positive results. So it sounds like buprenorphine actually decreases mortality, and it seems to enable people to get back to regular lives. They're able to go to work. They're able to actually function again, as opposed to just constantly searching for the next hit. That's right, Dan. These patients didn't start out as addicts. They used to be fully functional members of society. And there's no reason that we can't get them back there if we treat this disease state appropriately and in a non-judgmental way. It's very important to remember that when you're treating these patients, um, there's often a negative stigma associated with patients who come in either in overdose symptoms or withdrawal. Uh, I've seen it. I've felt it. It's, it's there. We should acknowledge it and then move past it. So just helping them get back on their feet in a non-judgmental way even if they have to come back six or seven times before they, they get there, we should continue to, to help them out as much as we can in an empathetic uh, way. That's an awesome point, RJ. If I saw a, another resident at the desk that was making fun of a diabetic because their sugars were so high, they would obviously be corrected right away. But sadly, people still make snide comments and, and honestly have a lot of stigma upon people that are suffering from addiction. Nobody chose to be a heroin addict, but they got there somehow, some way. And us in the medical profession actually had a part of how a lot of these folks actually got there by the overprescription of opioids. So we need to have a lot of compassion for these folks. Understand that sometimes it takes more than one attempt to quit, but do the very best to get the most evidence-based method of, of helping them quit, which right now appears to be buprenorphine. I'm glad you mentioned the example of the, the patient with diabetes. This is an example I use very frequently. When you have a patient who is being shamed for repeat visits for the same thing, they, they continue to use heroin and come back to the ED or continue to, to snort oxycodone and come back to the ED, eventually your staff will, will probably get sick of them, especially when they show up. They're probably going to be in withdrawal or they just got Narcan, so they're in acute withdrawal, and they're not going to be their best self. But when we have a patient who comes back every month or so in DKA, we don't shame them. So we, we just need to remember that this is a relapsing and remitting disease. We will likely see these patients again. They will slip up. Even people in long-term recovery slip up, and we need to encourage them, congratulate them on any sobriety they were able to maintain for as long as they could, and try to get them back on, on their feet. All right, RJ. So to go back to our patient narrative, this gentleman comes in, he's withdrawing. We give him four milligrams of buprenorphine because he is having some moderate withdrawal symptoms. We recheck on him, actually decide to give another four milligrams uh, an hour or two into his emergency department course. And then on recheck, his Cal score was now a two. He's feeling a lot better. We make a referral to an outpatient clinic where they can continue the use of buprenorphine to keep him safe and to help reduce his likelihood of relapsing and make sure that he's aware that he can always come back to the emergency department if he does have a relapse or has any issues at all. That's right. We should encourage these patients to come back if they have any issues. Uh, we should encourage them to let us know if something falls through with getting tied into a clinic and, and they need to come back to the ED or just get more follow-up care with any resources we may be able to provide. Another thing to consider is for our patient going back to the vignette is that he started using opioids for chronic back pain. So maybe we can additionally uh, offer some NSAIDs for some of his musculoskeletal pain and try to consider other options and using multimodal analgesia instead of depending on opioids to maintain this, this patient's comfort. In the past, many providers have turned to clonidine for some of the agitation and, and withdrawal symptoms. But again, if you use the cows and dose your buprenorphine appropriately, these symptoms should be minimized. It's not wrong to give clonidine with buprenorphine, but you shouldn't need it. And, and you might experience some unwanted side effects from the clonidine. So it's just something to consider. Okay. To summarize, it sounds like buprenorphine is the most evidence-based 
way to treat people with opioid use disorder. It decreases mortality, it keeps people clean for longer, and it's much safer in the emergency department setting than traditional agents such as methadone. Start with four milligrams of buprenorphine in patients that have moderate withdrawal, being cautious about people with only mild withdrawal symptoms as you could induce acute withdrawal. Redose patients if needed, and remember that the 72-hour rule allows people, even without an X waiver, to come back to the emergency department for continued treatment while you execute that warm handoff to an outpatient setting. Please get X waivered as you can currently do it for free with online courses. And please, please, please reduce the stigma of this disease. These patients need the very best from you, and it's very easy to fall into the trap of groaning whenever a patient comes back after relapsing yet again. They need you to show compassion and to give them the best care that you possibly can. That's right, Dan. We need to make sure we continue to treat these patients with compassion and support and remember that we're their doctors, not their judge and jury. And in signing off, I would just say, remember that this drug is a great option for many people. It's not a one size fits all for everybody, but it has been shown to save a lot of lives and it's very easy to use, even though it does have these additional regulatory requirements that a lot of people that make a lot of people nervous. Know that it's not that hard. You can always ask your ED pharmacist or more experienced ED providers for assistance in this area. Feel free to get psych or pain management involved with these patients, but you don't need to overcomplicate it. Use the cows, dose them, and reassess. And the, the main thing is to remember to tie them into outpatient treatment and treat them with respect and dignity. RJ, thank you so much for taking some time to discuss the best way to manage this very important patient population. Thanks again. Signing off for EM Basic and the Farm So Hard podcast. <music>